Hi everyone, it's Vulpix Inferno 91 and I'm here to solve some mysteries. The Fatal Frame series is said to be one of the greatest horror series, both in its gameplay and storytelling. The first Fatal Frame game is such an innovation in the genre, and the story really is a marvel. But some of the development is left to reading notes left in the mansion, and very little of the story is actually explained through character dialogue. If you miss a note, you miss a piece of information that could have been used to develop a certain character or plot point. Naturally, most people don't get all of the notes, and some of the plot devices seem a little strange, or they don't make sense. In other circumstances, people may pick up all the notes, but not in the correct order, so the story seems a little disjointed and you can't put the pieces together properly. But luckily, that's where I come in. I've played through the game a few times and done a little extra research on some of the plot points, and I'm going to present to you my findings. Some of it is fact, and some of it is my interpretation, but I hope it helps to demystify some of the occurrences and hopefully help clarify why things are happening in this game. So first, let's take a look at the main plot. Miku goes to the mansion. So, why does Miku go to the mansion? Well, it's to find her brother Mafuyu, who has also gone to the mansion and hasn't returned. The length of time he has been missing varies between the different versions of the game, but it's not really important. The important point is that he has disappeared and it's out of character, and this has worried Miku. After their mother committed suicide, it was just Miku and Mafuyu left, so we can assume that they were incredibly close siblings. Just Miku and Mafuyu against the world. Interesting to note as well that both Miku and Mafuyu have a sixth sense indicated when Miku says, I wonder how long it's been since my brother and I started seeing things other people can't see. So why did Mafuyu go to the mansion? Mafuyu had gone to the mansion to find another missing person, Junsei Takamine, a folklorist who had gone to the mansion to research his new book. Takamine was Mafuyu's mentor, and he felt incredibly indebted to him, so Takamine's disappearance concerned him enough to take a trip to the mansion. Takamine was inspired to venture to the mansion after researching another folklorist's notes, those of Ryozo Munakata, who also went missing in the mansion. But Ryozo went missing a significantly long time ago, we're talking generations and generations ago. It's not just a recent occurrence that Junsei Takamine decided to investigate. The Camera Obscura Mafuyu goes to the mansion armed with his mother's old camera, the Camera Obscura and soon realises it has the ability to exercise ghosts. It was passed down through the family, finally reaching our two heroes. When Miku enters the mansion, she finds the camera lying in the rope hallway. When she touches the camera, she sees an image of her brother running down the hallway away from a woman in a white kimono. A cool fact is that the camera is never actually referred to as a camera obscura in this game. That title only comes about in the second game, so it's unclear if this is the same camera or not. Personally, I think it's a different camera, because this one is destroyed at the end, revealing a piece of the Holy Mirror, which we'll explain about later. And Miku makes a reappearance in the third game, and so does the camera. So the destroyed camera was either put back together, or it's a different one entirely. Takamine and Friends Mr. Takamine ventured into the mansion with two other people, Koji Ogata, the editor at Takamine's publishing house, and his assistant, Tomoe Hirasaka. Tomoe had reservations about going to the house because of her sixth sense, but excited at the prospect of working with Mr. Takamine, she ignored these feelings and went anyway. After Koji saw an image of a woman in a white kimono, Tomoe took a picture of Koji in the mansion, and it revealed faint rope marks around his limbs. He was separated from the group and killed by the woman in the white kimono, his limbs and head strangled from his body. Tomoe and Junsei find his remains. Tomoe also explores the mansion on her own, and sees hazy images of a woman in a white kimono in the mirrors. She also sees the image of a younger girl in a white kimono asking for help. Tomoe discovers the woman's name is Kyrie. Her sixth sense allowed her to see visions that disturbed her, making her confused and taking a toll on her sanity. 
Unable to leave the mansion, Tomoe and Takamine decide to try and find a way to break the curse after Tomoe begins to have the same symptoms as Koji, mainly rope marks. Tomoe is finally killed by Kirie in the abyss in front of Takamine, her head and limbs strangled off. After making eye contact with Kirie, the curse then begins to afflict itself on Mr. Takamine too. Using Tomoe's findings, Mr. Takamine is led to the Narakami Shrine, looking for a piece of the Holy Mirror, which we'll find out about later. Here he is killed by Kirie. Miku follows these leads when in the mansion and soon also runs into Kirie and also becomes afflicted with the curse. The Rope Curse The Rope Curse is the curse afflicted on a person when they come into contact with the spirit of Kirie. It has several signs and symptoms that usually lead to an imminent death of the person afflicted. The first symptom is rope marks appear to form around the wrists and ankles of the victim. People then start to see things that aren't actually there. They're either hallucinating or their sixth sense is more attuned. The victim will also begin to lose their sanity. In the case of Koji, when he was afflicted with the rope curse and a picture was taken from him, those ropes could be seen in the photograph. So it's safe to say that this probably could have happened to other victims too. The final rope mark is actually around the neck. And when that does make itself visible, it usually means that the death is imminent. Finally, the cursed victim is stretched from the five points where the rope marks have made themselves known, and their limbs and head strangled from their body. The Holy Mirror Let's start with the five holy shrines. In the Himura mountain area, people worshipped five gods, each represented by a Shinto shrine in the region. Each shrine had a holy mirror inside, said to have been left by the five gods, in order to protect the area. Every ten years, the Five Gods Festival was held, where all the holy mirrors were brought together to fend off a disaster. An earthquake destroys these five holy mirrors not long before Miku comes to the mansion. It is thought that there was another holy mirror, known as the True Holy Mirror, and the other five protected this one. The true holy mirror was used during the strangling ritual which we'll talk about next, to stop the calamity. But when Kyrie's ritual failed and the malice escaped, the mirror was shattered into five pieces and scattered throughout the mansion. Miku made it her goal to find the pieces of the mirror and put them back together in order to cleanse Kyrie's spirit of the malice. The final piece of the holy mirror was inside the camera all along. Kyrie and the strangling ritual. Kyrie was the rope shrine maiden that was to take part in the strangling ritual. She was chosen to be the rope shrine maiden during the demon tag ritual of 1827 at around the age of seven, but we'll talk about the other rituals later. As part of the ritual, Kyrie was put into isolation for 3,669 days. She was only visited by four priests, all members of the Himura family but they were ordered to wear masks, probably so that Kyrie wouldn't get too attached to them, although she was allowed to roam the grounds of the mansion from time to time. It was important that her will to live wasn't strong and that she was willing to die, otherwise the ritual would fail. At the time of the ritual, the rope shrine maiden must go down to the moon well in order to purify herself in the moonlight. She must then go to the basement through the route only she is allowed to use. Everyone else in the ritual must go through the demon mouth. These paths lead to the ceremony chamber, and all are led in there by the Himura family master. The rope shrine maiden is tied to five pedestals by her wrists, ankles and neck. Four priests turn the wheels for the four limbs, and the Himura family master turns the wheel for the head. The maiden is killed, and her limbs and head are strangled from her body. The ceremony of ropes then takes place, where the blood-soaked ropes from the strangling ritual are used to seal off the gate to hell. If the ritual is successful, the hell gate is sealed, and the malice can't escape, and the calamity is prevented. The last strangling ritual was performed on the 13th of December, 1837, with Kyrie as the rope shrine maiden. The ritual failed and caused the calamity. As a result, the malice escaped and 1,347 souls were lost. 
The Calamity and the Malice The Calamity is the disaster that occurs when the strangling ritual fails. The gates to hell open up and the Malice escapes. People and spirits touched by the Malice either go insane or return as vengeful spirits. All those who died when the Calamity happened and all those who had died before in the mansion return as vengeful ghosts. The Himuro family master survived but went insane and killed all the other survivors before killing himself. Kyrie's spirit was touched by the malice and her miserable evil spirit remains, making everyone she came across feel the pain that she felt. She was also miserable as she was unable to fulfil her duty as a rope shrine maiden and the other details as to why she was miserable we will divulge in very soon. Why did the ritual fail? Near the end of her isolation period, Kyrie fell in love with a visitor who came to the mansion. He taught her about life outside the mansion and the beauty of the world, making her want to live and see it and also be with him. The priest became concerned with Kyrie's behaviour and told the young man that she was sick and that he couldn't see her anymore. But determined to visit the woman he loved, he tried to sneak into her cell. The priests informed the Himura family master of what was going on, and he ordered Kyrie's lover to be killed. They did so, and told Kyrie that the man had left the mansion. Kyrie didn't believe this, especially when her lover came to her in a dream, looking at her sadly and so she concluded that the priests were lying about the man leaving the mansion. Kyrie felt responsible for her lover's death, and coupled with her newfound will to live, caused the strangling ritual to fail. When she returned as an evil spirit, she spared Mafuyu from the fate she so willingly gave onto others. This is because Mafuyu bet a striking resemblance to her lover. Young Kyrie Throughout the game, Miku is visited by a young girl in a white kimono, who also shows herself to Tomoe. She helps Miku by pointing out useful objects and helping her escape from evil Kyrie. This is young Kyrie. This young girl in the white kimono is Kyrie's younger self. When Kyrie's soul was touched by the malice, it split in two. The second part of her was her younger self who embodied an innocent spirit and wished to help her older self to fulfil her duty as the Rope Shrine Maiden. The Gates of Hell and the Canon Ending Miku is reunited with Mafuyu who has also stood outside the Gates of Hell. But Kyrie approaches Mafuyu from behind and embraces him and absorbs him almost. Miku is distraught and she begins to battle Kyrie. But when she battles Kyrie, the camera can't handle the power of Kyrie's spirit and is destroyed. It literally explodes. But when this happens, it reveals the final piece of the Holy Mirror. Miku then can reassemble the Holy Mirror, and when she does, she places it back in the recess in the rock, facing the Hellgate. When Kyrie is reflected in the Holy Mirror, her soul is cleansed of the malice. She returns to her former self, her spirit rejoins with the spirit of her younger self, and Mafuyu is freed. Kyrie willingly attaches herself to the ropes on either side of the Hellgate in order to fulfil her duty to seal it. She gives herself to this duty for eternity, living her entire existence in pain in order to stop the calamity happening again. Mafuyu decides to stay with her, as he feels he can assist her and help ease the pain and help keep her hope alive. Mafuyu accepts that this is his destiny and is willing to stay with Kyrie. Miku escapes the mansion but Mafuyu becomes trapped. But when she leaves, she sees all of the souls of the spirits leaving the mansion to go back to where they belong. From this day forward, she stops seeing things that other people can't see. Other Endings while the ending we just discussed is considered the canon ending for the series, there are other endings that can be viewed when you beat the game in a higher difficulty. The Mafuyu ending 
sees Mafuyu leaving Kirie alone and escaping the mansion with Miku, although it is clear he feels remorse at leaving Kirie alone. The final ending that can be viewed is exclusive to the Xbox version of this game. As with the Mafuyu ending, both protagonists manage to escape the mansion, but in this version, the spirit of Kyrie's lover returns, and the two embrace. It's the nice ending! Shame it's not the real ending! So now that we've discussed the main plot, we're actually going to take a bit of a look into the subplots that we see in the game. Well, some of these subplots are pretty central to the story, they're not as well explained as other parts of the story, and you could probably go through the game without even knowing these things happened, and it wouldn't really affect the outcome of your understanding of the ending. So this is why I consider these to be subplots. So first we're going to take a look at Miku chasing Mafuyu. Now when Miku walks around the mansion, she keeps seeing Mafuyu wandering too, but he doesn't answer, so we're going to quote one of Mafuyu's notes now. The mansion has started to change. As far as I can figure out, the ghosts are trying to pull me into the past. The spirits are using their power to make parts of the mansion revert to the way they were in the past. This has been interpreted as there being some kind of time warp in the mansion. And this is backed up by another one of Mafuyu's notes, where he mentions seeing Miku in the mansion, and leaving notes for her specifically. It may be that he is seeing shadows of Miku walking around the mansion, maybe even calling to her and she's not answering back due to the time warp, but hey, that's speculation. So now we're going to take a look at the rituals that are performed in the Himura mansion, and there were three rituals that were performed. We've already discussed the strangling ritual, but there were two rituals that came before it, which were there in order to determine the next Rope Shrine Maiden. The first ritual that took place was the blinding ritual. This ritual is performed as to create a demon that chooses the next Rope Shrine Maiden in the Demon Tag ritual which we'll talk about next. The ritual is performed using the blinding mask, which is an eye mask with two stakes where the eye holes should be, and so when the mask is worn, the wearer is blinded. The blood on the mask is used to weaken and blind spirits beyond the Hell Door, also known as the Gates of Hell, and create a blind demon. This blind demon then takes part in the demon tag ritual. The blinding mask is also a key to the door found in the demon's mouth which leads to the rope holder. Once the demon has been created from the blinding ritual, the demon tag ritual can take place. In this ritual, all girls in the Himuro family above the age of 7 years, 9 months and 25 days are required to play, and the demon tag ritual specifically takes place on the 26th of November. All the girls are chased by the newly blinded demon. The game is played until all of the girls have been caught by the blinded demon. The first girl to be caught becomes the next blind demon in the blinding ritual, and the last girl to be caught becomes the next rope shrine maiden in the strangling ritual. Family Tree So we're going to look at the family tree for Miku and Mafuyu specifically, but this one can get a little complicated. So we're going to start back from the earliest point with Yai and Ryozo Munakata. Fun fact actually, Yai is the twin of Sai Kurosawa from the second Fatal Frame game, and this is the point where she meets Ryozo. But I'm getting a little bit off topic, so we're just going to focus on their context in this game. It is thought that Yai and Ryozo lived in Himuro Mansion with their daughter Mikoto. They all moved together as Ryozo was a folklorist researching the mansion and wanted his family around him especially his wife Yai, who was in poor health. Mikoto came across the camera obscura whilst there, and said a girl in a white kimono had given it to her, who we now know to be young Kirie. Yai used the camera as a normal one, and when taking a picture of Mikoto and her friends, another figure is seen in the picture. Young Kirie! Yai begins to use the camera more and more, seeing more and more spirits, until she didn't need the camera to see them anymore. One day she let Mikoto use the camera when Mikoto and her friends were playing Demon Tag in the mansion. Note as well, this version of Demon Tag isn't the Demon Tag ritual as explained before, it is literally just blind man's bluff like hide and seek. They're not actually like being chased by an actual demon here. All of the children disappeared, except for Mikoto, who was led away by a girl in a white kimono and to safety. 
but we'll talk about the fate of the missing children later. Yai, who was overcome by the power of the camera, and also felt she was responsible for the disappearance of the children, committed suicide by hanging herself from the tree in the cherry atrium. Ryozo, finding Yai hanging and still unable to find his daughter Mikoto, decided to stop the strange happenings in the mansion. Armed with a piece of the holy mirror and the blinding mask, he went down to the demon mouth and opened the door, where he was pulled in by Kyrie and killed, his corpse still holding a piece of the holy mirror. All alone, Mikoto was taken in and looked after by the Hinasaki family. They lived in the nearby area and were friends with the Munakatas. Mikoto grew up and married an unknown man and gave birth to her daughter called Miyuki. As Mikoto's husband is unknown, her married name and therefore Miyuki's maiden name are unknown. Bringing it back to Mikoto's adopted family, Miyuki, her daughter, actually married into the Hinasaki family and is therefore only known by her married name. This marriage is speculated to have been arranged by the Hinasaki family who were connected through Mikoto when they took her in. Miyuki was a student of Masato Hinasaki, whom she married. Miyuki had a strong sixth sense, which she passed on to her children, who happened to be our two heroes, Miku and Mafuyu. Miyuki found the power of the camera obscura too overwhelming like her grandmother before her, and committed suicide in a similar fashion. They even show a striking resemblance, Miku going as far as to mistake the hanging ghost of Yai as her mother, a mistake made by many fans as well, including myself for a while. So, let's bring it back. How are these people related? This would make Mikoto Miku's grandmother. A fact that Mafuyu hints to in a note he leaves for Miku in the Himura mansion. So this would make Ryozo and Yai Miku's great-grandparents. Some of the ghosts. Now I thought I'd focus on two of the ghosts in particular who I think have incredibly cool stories. This is more a personal thing for me. Most of the ghosts in this game don't have a lot of development, they're just kind of there. But these two in particular seem to have really nice backstories. So we're gonna have a look, firstly, at the Himura family master. He's also known as Lord Himuro, and he was the family master at the time of the Calamity. His face is never shown, as he is always wearing the mask of reflection. This mask when worn depicts the nature of the wearer, and when he wore the mask it showed the face of a demon. He led the performance of the rituals in the Himura mansion and also ordered the killing of Kyrie's lover. After the failed ritual and the calamity he was driven insane and killed everyone he came across, his signature being beheading his victims with his katana. He killed the four priests which were also present at the rituals. I'm also going to focus on Mr. Longarms. Not only did I think he was a woman, <laughs> true story, I thought he was a woman, but after I kind of got over that I thought he was a bit of a freaky child snatcher, but I took a bit more of an in-depth look at it, and his story is actually quite a sad one. Mr. Longarms' daughter took part in the demon tag ritual, but it's at an unknown date. All we know is it took place before Kyrie's demon tag ritual. As it was compulsory for all Himura family members to have their daughters take part in the ritual, he had no choice but to put her in for participation. She was the last child to be caught, so became the next rope shrine maiden, which deeply saddened him. As was the case for all rope shrine maidens, they were to be kept in isolation for around 10 years to purify them. So he must have never have seen his daughter in this time and that made him die bitter and unsettled about the situation. Hence his return as a spirit in the Himura mansion, his intentions to find his daughter and never resting until he was reunited with her. Longarms often mistakes other children as his long lost daughter and so snatches them away. Three of his known victims are Clockboy, Crawling Girl and Girl in the Wall, the three children who came to the mansion to play demon tag with Makoto. Based on a true story, it's been claimed that this game is in fact based on a true story. Heck, it's even written on the front of the boxes and some of the versions. So in a press release, 
Makoto Shibata, chief producer of Fatal Frame, described the inspiration for the game's haunted house. The game's frightening story is based upon two Japanese folk tales, both originating from the rural mountainous regions of the country. Interestingly, the Japanese and European versions of the game don't make the statement about truthfulness of the story. Nowhere have I found any particular evidence saying that there is a Himura mansion, but I haven't found anything to say that it doesn't exist. But I have found things to say that it's an urban legend. I'll put a link in the description box below to the full statement released by Mikoto Shibata, so you can read it and make your own mind up whether you believe that the story is true or not, because he does go into quite a bit of depth as the inspiration behind the mansion. So it really is up to you if you want to decide whether or not this is based on a true story. Personally, I don't think it is, just because they don't put that as a tagline on our version of the game. So if it was based on a true story, surely they would, but they didn't. The fish tank room. Okay, so finding out the purpose of the fish tank room was a personal thing, really. But on finding out what it does, I thought I should share it as it's pretty cool. I wasn't sure if it was actually a fish tank or not, because why would you have a whole room dedicated to a fish tank? Well, guess what? It's food storage! <laughs> Large fish would have been kept in there and then taken away when they were wanted as food, because consuming fish this way ensured their freshness. Earthquakes. When reaching the later portions of this game, several times the mansion rocks with the earthquakes. So why are they happening? Maybe they're aftershocks from the earthquake that broke the five holy mirrors. But then why did that one happen? Maybe the earthquakes are happening because the spirits are unsettled. Then why didn't it happen in the first half of the game? Fuck knows.